Hi, I'm Hayley Victoria and welcome back to my Crime and Policing channel. In today's session, we're going to continue our forensic investigations and importantly, we're going to start looking at ballistic evidence. So, when people say ballistic up north in England where I'm from, they mean someone's, something's kicking off and something's going mad, right? But actually, ballistic evidence is all about guns, firearms and their component parts recovered from crime scenes. So this could be casings, uh, bullets, the component parts of a gun and the accessories that come with those as well. You look at entry and exit points of the, um, the article that is being expelled, the missile. We look at the flight path of a bullet. Lots of different things are taken into consideration with ballistic evidence, which is fascinating, right? There are some really good tutorials you can watch um, on YouTube and stuff as well. So I'll, put, I'll pop a link in the description and yeah, have a look at those, really, really interesting. So we do have specialist firearms officers in the UK and that's like a, an extra part of the policing role. So if you do your two years um, as a probationer in the police, after that you can start to specialise and go into different areas. So to be a firearms officer, you need to be really, really trained, like the best of the best and stuff. It, You've got to go through a lot of different training in order to be able to carry such a thing. So in the UK, you're not allowed to, to carry weapons. It's, it's not like a done thing. Certainly not handguns after done blame. Um, yeah, so it's massively different to how it is in the US. Knife crimes prevailing in the UK, which is not so much in the United States. Um, it's a lot of the firearms over there and people kill each other, no matter where you are in the world. They just find different ways of doing it. But over here, firearms aren't that readily available thankfully. So when we're looking at ballistic evidence then, like I said, you're looking at firearms and the things surrounding that firearm. So under section 57 of the Firearms Act 1968, a firearm is um, includes any lethal barreled gun, um, weapon, sorry, of any description of which any shot, bullet or other missile can be discharged. Okay, and that can include the component parts of a firearm, um, and any accessory as well so something that might silence it or which might um, prevent the flash from a firearm flashing I don't know why I'm doing a flash flash in there um, yeah so those accessories as well that, that includes that um, and depending on the relevant legislation it can include um, air rifles imitation firearms realistic imitation firearms that are readily convertible as well it's important when these things are seized in fact we'll talk about that in a lot more depth now actually so when you're preserving and collecting firearms evidence from a scene you don't touch it that's the first rule of firearms club at a csi investigation do not touch any firearms you find and that's like with any bit of evidence really but really be careful around these things the first thing that happens is photographed in situ which means where it is so and that includes every part of the evidence remember not just the weapon itself but bullets component parts etc photographed in situ. After you've photographed the evidence where it is in relation to the crime scene, it's then made safe by a specialist firearms officer. So the specialist firearms teams know how to make these weapons safe, but before they do that, they need to make sure they've got where the safety catch is on the photos, where the hammer is in relation to the gun and, and the barrel as well, where all the different parts and that make it go, basically. So we can prove whether or not that has been fired and that is the same one which has caused any injuries or damage at the scene. So the first thing they do is make it safe because you don't want that going off in your hand. You don't want to kill anybody else and obviously you don't want to cause any damage, right? When you're collecting firearms, like with other things as well, you might be getting some forensic material off there, some DNA opportunities, you might get fingerprints and things like that. You might get uh, GSR, so your gunshot residue, and blood and things like that. It's important when you package these, you wear gloves. You should always wear gloves when you're on a crime scene. Um, that, I don't know how many of you are on crime scenes right now. Anyway, always wear gloves when you're on a crime scene so you don't take pieces of evidence with you and you don't put your evidence there. Simple, right? Um, and it's important that you handle it carefully because you don't want to contaminate or to um, corrupt any evidence that's on those exhibits. Handle carefully, they're never stored in plastic bags because those plastic bags can cause any DNA opportunities to be um, contaminated and corrupted and stuff like that. So they generally go in paper bags 
or in little cardboard boxes and things as well. So they're collected properly at the scene, not touched. It's definitely made safe by a specifically firearms trained officer. Okay, that makes sense, right? So when you're looking at a scene and it's firearms related, those bullets can travel for miles. Those missiles can go for a long, 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 long way. And it's important to look at any areas where they might get stuck. So it could be like walls, trees, things like that, sheds. They could get stuck in things. And that's really important for us to try and find out the flight path of those missiles. When these things are found in trees and walls and stuff like that, the investigators will try and dislodge it by removing the material on the outside. So not the missile itself, from the material on the outside. And that's because you don't want to scratch that missile because if you do, you might actually corrupt the evidence that you can find on that. So you might get opportunities on the um, trajectory itself for recovering DNA, fibres, hairs, fingerprint impressions, um, and also uh, any such as in the, in the, doing it, <laughs> in, in the bullets. So when it passes through the barrel of a gun, it makes an identifying mark. So if you scratch that while you try to dig it out of a tree, you've ruined that evidence. There is one gun, I believe, going around South Yorkshire, which is the most used weapon. They've still not caught it yet. Don't know where it is, but we're finding the um, the bullets from those that match time and time again. I've still not found that firearm. Um, anything else you need to say? Yeah, so we don't uh, use plastic bags. Um, was, oh, it's really important to make note of the make, model, calibre of the firearm as well and serial numbers. So they do have serial numbers on. Sometimes if they're used uh, excessively in the underground stuff like that, the serial numbers might get get um, filed off and stuff like that. Um, any letters, symbols and the frame or barrel can help it to be identified, which is amazing, right? And it can help us identify the origin of that firearm. There are characteristics which come with particular models and stuff like that. Um, so for example, the Occult 32 pistol has six lands and grooves twisting left. So that's, you know where it's come from with that one. So they do have their own characteristics as well. And you have got obviously ballistic experts who will be able to identify those, which is super important. Okay, you also look for spent cartridges as well. So I mentioned like, you know, you find little bullets and stuff in wood doors etc looking for spent cartridges as well because imagine if you're touching those it's going to get more forensic opportunities and stuff on that as well super right because remember every contact leaves a trace so thanks Lockhart. so when a firearm is discharged so as well as the uh, the, the missile the bullet coming out of there all the stuff comes out too so your shell is ejected and um you get something called gunshot residue and that's any unburned and burned particles of uh, primer and propellant together with material derived from the cartridge case, projectile and gun barrel that comes out. It's like poof. And this stuff, these microscopic particles of stuff get everywhere. So we mentioned before in the video about pollen and dust and stuff like that. And this is the same with GSR or gunshot residue. Um, so depending where the gunshot residue lands, you can tell where the the gun was. It's really, really interesting. So you can find this out from the angle of the gun, where the GSR has gone and where people are likely to be stood, which is obviously very important when trying to recreate these crime scenes. This GSR can get everywhere. So any clothing and materials that aren't on, um, on, on the victim, for example, if they've already been taken for examination, you collect all the other stuff too, carefully, um, you know, collecting it and preserving it because if you start folding stuff, you're going to be dislodging the particles of the stuff, which can contaminate your exhibit. At the scene of a crime, or you, as soon as you get to the suspects, you want to swab their hands immediately in case of getting any of this gunshot residue. And also, um, it's, people have had it on the face before, because, you know, you get like the back... <laughs> I don't know what it is. So it, it gets like it blows back on you and stuff as well. It gets absolutely everywhere. And people will be swabbed... Um, and all the other techniques and tricks we do to recover this evidence from a crime scene. Super important, right? So as you know, I love history and I like to tie in crime and history and how we got here. And I'm gonna talk about ballistic evidence now in the first murder case solved by these methods, which was in 1784, and it was a murder of Edward Culshaw. 
So on January the 19th, Edward was walking home from work. He'd got his pocket full of wages, walking home from work in Liverpool, um, back to Widnes. And he was walking along the Ditton Bank Farm, um, which was in Widnes, when he was shot and killed. So he had a gunshot wound to the head. And when he was found, he had a horse pistol under his body. So a horse pistol looks like the guns they used to have, like the old highwaymen used to have. So I'll put a picture up here. Um, if you've ever seen Adam and the Ants stand and deliver, think of that kind of thing. So the highwayman had um, shot him, killed him, took his wages from him, nice, and left the gun under the body. Well, that's not all the killer left behind. So in the wound on um, Edward Coleshaw's head was some wadding. Now wadding is scraps of paper that they um, used to put on the barrel of the gun. So there'd be the... Um, the, like a lead ball, the gunpowder and the scraps of paper to hold it tight in there so it could be projected, so it could be could be shot and you know it was a nice, it made a tight space within the gun. So wadding was commonly used for this purpose. Now the wadding retrieved from Edward Crawshaw's wound was from an old song sheet, so a song sheet used to have in the pubs. So now you'd have karaoke and everyone's smashing out a bit of Tina Turner. Back then they'd have song sheets, right? Um, so wasn't uncommon to have song sheets but it did lead him to a line of investigation because they're like someone's been in pub right let's see what we can find and their investigations led to a man called john toms now john was searched and about his person he had a song sheet and guess what there was a bit missing nice one john he was found guilty thankfully of the murder of edward culshaw and he was later hanged so how important is that this is a first case, murder case, solved by using forensic evidence, which was ballistics, ballistic evidence. How important is that? There is still a memorial stone for Edward Culshaw. It's not where the scene was, it used to be, but then it was vandalised. So in the UK, we've got a lot of people using graffiti and stuff and tagging and stuff. And it's never even good, kind of mentioned. Like, when you see a nice piece of art, that's fine. But when it's someone's memorial stone, come on guys, that's gross. Anyway, yeah, so you can still go see the Memorial Stone and it's a massive piece of history for us here in the UK and across the world, right? So, um, and John Toms was hung at Lancaster um, at the castle there, I believe, where all the um, corporal punishment was, was handed out back then in that area. So Lancaster Castle has a rich history of crime and punishment. If you ever are in the UK or if you live in the UK and get a chance to go, go and have a look. They do tours. Um, really interesting and there's some proper weird vibes there as well and they've got a gift shop I don't even work for them look at me selling it um, yeah so and if you look at the list of everybody who was hung and um, killed a death penalty in that area John Toms is on there so you know this is a true story so yeah stay safe don't commit any crimes and uh, yeah thank you very much for tuning in bye